it's hard to tell these days, but the sleepy Truckee River Canyon was at one time home to thousands of people who, thanks to the ice industry, lived in over six separate towns, all between Truckee and Reno. Now, these towns faded away as fast as the ice melted, leaving little but faded memories and a few scattered remains behind. After it was all said and done, only one town remained. Floriston. This unassuming little hamlet just over the California border might not seem like much today, but 150 years ago, it was a very different scene. In 1899, the Floriston Pulp and Paper Company was formed by the stockholders of the Crown Paper Company and interested parties from the California citrus industry and the National Ice Company. Their dream? Simple to build the second largest paper and pulp mill company in the world. The remote location was perfect with enough open land to house the ginormous new facility, a seemingly endless supply of trees to make the paper, and it could be powered entirely from the massive amount of water flowing through the Truckee River. And they immediately set out to build a state-of-the-art company town to house the projected 600 workers and their families. But first, what exactly is a company town? Back before cars, it was a lot harder to get around. So people needed to live where they could walk to work. Company towns built as a seemingly ideal solution for businesses in remote locations. These private owned towns, the company owned everything, all provided free of charge for the employees of the company. It isn't going to cost you one cent. All you have to do is sign this little scrap of paper. Sign right here. Mm, mind if I read it first? But as we all know, nothing in life is free. Freedom? Well, sign away my freedom. Why, this is... The companies would lease the houses to their employees, contingent on their continual employment. Some towns provided housing completely in lieu of wages. Other towns, like Floriston, simply deducted a fixed sum straight from the check. Food and general supplies were also provided by the company via script, which was also in lieu of wages and only good at the company store. The main problem with these communities, when you make no actual wages, you have no means to leave no home if you do decide to leave, and no fare for transportation to actually leave these remote towns. In addition, these private-owned towns had no elected officials or municipality, no law enforcement or social services. This left workers completely dependent upon the company, who would, in the case of Floriston, often exploit and overwork them. In the beginning, there was much excitement and promise for the paper company. It brought a huge amount of capital with it. Jobs, housing, schools, and industry. All of which that area had been lacking for some time. Work began immediately on the 160-acre town, which once completed had 46 cottages, three bunkhouses, one schoolhouse, a hospital, a store, a really grand hotel, and a recreation hall with a spring-loaded dance floor. A spring-loaded dance floor. Yeah. Huh. Even had a fancy new railroad depot and a post office. May 22nd, 1900, the Floriston Pulp and Paper Mill Company opened its doors with 150 men in its employ. At the time of its opening, it was the second largest paper and pulp mill company in the world. And how much does it cost to build the second largest paper and pulp mill company in the world? A mere $500,000. Let's throw that in the old inflation calculator, shall we? That's over $17 million. So what exactly did this impressive structure do? Well, its primary function was to make tissue paper. 
but not the kind you're thinking. The kind for oranges. Remember a few minutes ago when I said that they went into business with the California produce industry? At this time, all of the oranges shipped from the fertile California valleys were wrapped in floristin tissue, packed into Central Pacific Railway cars from the swanky new Floriston terrain station, all while being refrigerated by locally harvested Truckee River ice. And this fruit went everywhere, even as far as New York City. This was an impressive mill, and it didn't take long for some pretty impressive problems to surface. Working for a paper plant was a hard and often dangerous job. Employee mishaps due to mismanagement began to happen as soon as the plant had opened its doors. Within the first month, Len Dorsey had already lost an arm, and William Cushion had lost a hand. And what happens when you lose an arm or a hand at the paper mill company? Well, you don't only lose your job, but you get kicked out of the company town, leaving you and your family homeless. Before 1911, there were no workers' compensation laws in the state of California, so there was no severance or hazard pay. The first of many lawsuits against the company, the 1901 lawsuit by the Schwinn family for the loss of their barely 19-year-old son, who had just taken a job as an electrician at the paper mill company. At first, the paper mill company released a statement saying that he was killed by a live wire which was included in the waiver he signed when he came on to be an electrician. However, it turns out they were hiding the real story from the public, which was he was crushed between two cars on the side of the track. He was told by a superintendent to go up to the hotel on an errand. There were two unoccupied railroad cars on the track with space in between to walk through. While walking through, a carload of wood was let down and struck one of the cars, jamming them together, crushing him. He was then brought to the hotel and the town doctor came to assess his injuries. The official statement said that the boy was only conscious for two minutes and that during that two minutes, he was able to say that it was no fault of the paper mill company and that there was no need to call his parents, at which point he then died. He miraculously was able to make these statements with completely crushed rib cages. The first of what become many trips by Deputy McDonald, which always came to the same conclusion that it was no fault of the company or its doctor. Around 1903, the large amount and often horrific deaths of the paper mill company employees started. Oftentimes, the deaths would be misreported by the paper company only to have the true story come out later. The problem that would eventually be the end of the paper company started way back in 1900. Because upon opening the mill, they agreed to flume the mill water into a bed of an old ice pond instead of back into the Truckee River. It seems the pond they'd promised to feed the contaminated water never happened. So they were just taking all of the sludge, chemicals, waste, and dumping it directly into the Truckee River. To quickly shut down the bad publicity, the president of the company agreed to immediately spend $15,000 to help purify the water. Now the situation became much more dire when all of the fish began to die from the Truckee River beginning in 1905. Floriston lawyers explained that pollution had existed previous to the mill's operation and it was no fault of the mill or its byproduct. This caused the state of Nevada to officially sue the paper company. And in 1906, it was court ordered for the paper company to build a 2,000 foot line of pipe to pipe the water away from the Truckee River to an old ice pond on the other side of the canyon. The following year, it was reported that the company was still dumping its acid into the river. The townspeople of Floriston had had enough and threatened to strike. 
Their demands, simple. They wanted higher livable wages, proper medical care, and they would give the company until four o'clock that day to provide them. Respondents of the Reno Gazette Journal went to Florissant to find out what happened. The normally very tight-lipped employees, they said they'd put up with the abuse too long. The company had no choice but to give in and provide all of its employees with a higher livable wage. But there was no amount of improvements that could hide the fact that they were still poisoning the Truckee River. It was found that it was impossible for them to comply with the order to dispose their waste elsewhere. Made the official decision to shut down. With the paper company went the town and no one was offered the ability to buy their homes and everybody had to move. Now you'd think that would have been Floriston's Inn. In 1947, Preston L. Wright of San Francisco purchased the property. His goal, simple, to provide affordable housing to the good people of Floriston. And for the second time in 120 years, the residents of Floriston were free to own their own homes. And we are here in Floriston, which is the only community uh, in this area that is actually still being lived in and is still actually a community. The post office here was open all the way up until uh, from 1891 until 2011. Now this company town right here, you can still see some of the houses back here. And so the company houses all look the same. You can kind of see that with the one next to it too. It's mighty slow. Still it has its push and go. So what we're, right here's behind me, we've got the Florissant Bridge. For me, there was a man in Derby Town as strong as any ox. And then down here, we have where the old ice pond sat for the Florissant Ice Company. That ice pond right there was for the paper and pulp mill company, which is right here behind me. The freeway here actually took it out. There's times in life when nature seems to slip a cog and go, just the rattling down creation. Not, I don't want to say they were, you know, an unethical company. I'm just saying a lot of people died during their tenure and not by natural causes. And it killed the river and killed all the fish. But it did provide jobs to the town of Floriston. And your gloom turned into gladness and it soon drive away the doubt when the open door is open and the smell comes oozing out. Then you feel just like a racer that's the trade is for a trot. When your mammy's dead to blessing and the table and bread is hot, while the electric light of heaven seems to settle on the spot. When your mammy's dead to blessing and the corn falls hot. Say hi, Jerry. Jerry and I, look how excited he is. He's super excited about this. Say hi.